Hello, you're listening to Send in the Experts with Georgina Durant. This podcast is all about teaching and supporting children and young people with special educational needs and disabilities, SEND. My name is Georgina Durant. I'm the host of this podcast brought to you by Twinkle SEND. As a former teacher in Senko myself, I wanted to create a platform to share some of the amazing things that my guests are doing to support learners with SEND. So whether you're listening on your commute, tuning in whilst walking your dog or curled up on the sofa with a nice cup of coffee, thank you so much for joining us. In this episode, I'm delighted to be joined by MP Claire Coutinho to discuss the SEND and AP improvement plan that was launched on Thursday last week. Claire Coutinho was appointed Parliamentary Undersecretary of State at the Department for Education in October last year. She was previously Parliamentary Undersecretary of State at the Department for Work and Pensions and has been a Conservative MP for East Surrey since December 2019. Hi Claire, thank you so much for asking to come on the podcast. Would you mind just briefly explaining your role and in particular your responsibilities as Parliamentary Undersecretary of State Minister for Children, Families and Wellbeing to our listeners? please. Well, thank you so much for having me on. It's it's an absolute privilege to do my role. So I uh, look after everything sort of to do within the Department for Education to do with children's and families and well-being. So yeah. some of that includes things like children in the care system. So uh, a few weeks uh, before this, we launched a report called Stable Homes Built on Love, trying to look at what we can do there. Uh, part of it is early years in childcare. And then the part that we're talking about today is special educational needs. Um, and I'm very, very delighted to be doing it. Brilliant. So last week, you launched the long-awaited <laughs> Send an AP Improvement Plan, which is basically how the government plans to improve support and services for children and young people with special education needs and disabilities and those in alternative provision. Just to give some background to our listeners, so in 2019, the government looked at and reviewed the Send an AP system. Then they wrote this green paper about it titled Send Review, Right Support, Right Place, Right Time, and that was published in March last year, and people refer to that as the Send Review. And as it was a green paper, lots of people were able in and out of parliament to give feedback on it. And that plan that was in response to the SEM review was out last week. Um, who did the government receive feedback from and as part of the SEND review, Claire? And importantly, what difficulties did the SEND review identify? So we, I think we received four and a half, that we talked to four and a half thousand people wow. and we received 6,000 um, pieces of feedback on our online consultation. So this was yep. thousands and thousands of people that we spoke to and it was all parts of the system. So we looked at, um, you know, the experience of parents and families going through the system, the outcomes of young people. We talked to schools, we talked to colleges, we talked to early years providers, you know, alternative provision, all parts of it. Uh, and I think the biggest feedback which is something which completely mirrors what I was hearing as a constituency MP because I represent an area which has seen one of the biggest rises in demand for EHCPs and there's a lot okay. of special educational needs in my uh, local area. Uh, we heard from sort of parents and families that they found the system really adversarial. It was yeah. a battle to try and get the right support. And you've got to think, you know, in terms of parents and families, they they know that their child only gets one shot at education. So the pressure to, to, to get all of those bits of support that they need for their child is immense. Uh, and they were saying it feels like a battle. We can't get the help that we need. Obviously, we heard about really long waiting lists and... Yeah. Um, just just it being a struggle and I think then on the other side of it we heard from sort of teachers and early as educated I've been around the country talking to all sorts of people as, as part of my work as well um, who were sort of saying that they they weren't confident they weren't sure what it is they should be doing they could sense that, that there were sort of needs increasing mm -hmm. uh, but they didn't feel necessarily like they had the tools to address things as well so yeah. I think the picture was in 2014, we expanded rights. That was a good thing. But now we really need to make sure that we work on the delivery so that people can get those rights and we can do this in a way which feels inclusive uh, and which feels well supported. Yeah, absolutely. I read in the plan, it said too many parents have lost faith in a system that's not sufficiently yeah. responsive to them, which is sort of what you've covered. What yeah. are you going to, how are you going to regain the family and teachers trust? Because there are a lot of people that are feeling very disengaged by the SEND system. Yes, absolutely. That's what we're setting out to do. So we're looking at all different parts of the system. I think first, really crucially, we're going to be working with parents and carers uh, yeah. on setting up new national standards. So that yeah. will cover all parts of the system. And we'll look at how we can use the best possible evidence to make sure that there's consistency around the country, that there's good provision, um, and that it's quality. So that that's part one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, secondly, we'll be looking at the workforce. We know that specialist provision is really important. So we're trying to make sure that we've got uh, the right people in place and for example we've already set out plans to uh, increase the number of educational psychologists which are so yes, important in getting that. that diagnosis right 
Um, and then we'll look at accountability as well, making sure that both local authority and school level accountability is there. Mm -hmm. uh, and also working with, uh, you know, parents and, and families as well to make sure that their voices are heard. And again, just to emphasize, this will be whole, whole systemic change. So one yeah. of the things that we're asking um, local areas to do, for example, is to come up with local inclusion plans, which will look at all yeah. parts of the systems, whether it's FE, whether it's alternative provision, again, the whole the whole piece so that they can assess what needs are in their area. And then we can work to making sure that those needs are met. Yeah, brilliant. So one problem that was identified during the send and send review was the postcode lottery, wasn't it? The idea that, and I've seen it, children and young people with send yeah. in different areas across the country receiving different or experiencing different levels of support and um, services. How will the plan address that? Is that through the national standards then? So, I mean, I would say it's actually further than a postcode lottery because actually it's a school lottery and it's also a bit of a family background lottery because we know that actually yeah. in the exact same area, you could have sort of families going through the very same thing, mm -hmm. but getting very diff different results. Yeah. And what we're doing is firstly, yes, national standards. So we're trying to learn from the best possible areas. And people sometimes ask, is this a way of watering down? Because these will be the maximum standards. And if you're really good, then you won't, you know, people won't want to go above it. But absolutely not. This should be seen as a minimum standard. And then people can build on that with expertise expertise and flexibility as well but yeah. as you say it's it's about trying to make sure that consistency is there across the country but secondly I think the other part which is really important is we're doing a much more sort of strategic sense of assessment in areas so okay. We've changed things, for example, like the area inspection framework to, again, look at what's happening across the whole area. And I think that, again, the overall partnerships and plans uh, in an area to look at all the needs should, again, improve that consistency for parents. Yeah. So th these national standards, then, who will oversee them? Will that be Ofsted? Because we had a question, actually. Sorry, we had a question on Twitter. I think it was Dr. Sam, Bat Dr. Sam Batishaw, who is an assistant head in Senko, and specifically said, how will schools and other providers be held to account for these national standards? I think because there's a bit of concern about how schools will be supported to implement these changes and like, the clarity of the standards and all that that comes with it. So this is something that we're going to be working through with the sector and with parents okay. and carers. So our first thing that we're going to be doing is setting up a steering group with parents and carers to identify which of those national standards are the first ones that you might want right. to address. You know, it might be something like the sensory environment in schools. Actually, we know some areas are doing that really well. And yeah. maybe we want a national standard on how that works really well. Okay. So, again, people don't have to reinvent the wheel. But, uh, you know, the second part of that will be looking at how you can um, make sure that schools have everything they need to deliver the, the national standards. So yeah. this is about a sort of a multi-step process of making sure that we can get the best possible evidence, work out what works, and then help everyone in the system to achieve that and look at accountability there as well. Yeah, I'm pleased you said accountability because that's another thing that um, a lot of people on social media have asked was about accountability, not just for schools, but particularly thinking about local authorities yeah. and education yeah. and healthcare plans. How will the reforms ensure that local authorities provide schools with the funding that each child's EHCP provision requires? Because that, we know that's not happening across the country at the moment. So this is one of the things I get asked the most about, I think, yeah. is, is local authority accountability. And I think there's really there's two parts to it. Okay. So firstly, we have changed that area inspection framework, which mm -hmm. now will include not only the local authority, but all of its partners. So, for example, for the first time, we've got a social care inspector, which will be part of that um, inspection, because actually we, we know that sometimes when people aren't getting what they need, it isn't just education. It can also be the health side of things yeah. as well. But it's also including things like timeliness for the first time, timeliness of, of, of getting things to parents so I think changing yes. that overall assessment is really important um, but secondly what we, we try to do in the plan and hopefully that that comes across is get under the bonnet of why local authorities aren't delivering mm -hmm. so if you look at for example why you don't get the timeliness or the assessment done in time or the support done in time there's actually usually quite a few things going on it might be that they can't get access to the specialist workforce which is why we're doing this joint strategy with health it might be that they can't get um, you know, the right sort of teachers training in place. So we're looking at those parts as well. But what, what we're trying to do is, is the accountability is sort of there in the system through the new inspection, but also the, the tribunal process, which we all know very well. But we want to make sure that it's also about getting them the tools and equipment so that they can succeed, because that's what we ultimately want them to deliver. Yeah, absolutely. And there's some, um, I read about you've got some national and local inclusion dashboards. Are you able to tell me a little bit about those? And importantly, like... If these dashboards flag up that there's an area that needs that send support isn't good enough or yeah. and they need extra support, will you be then would they get extra support if they're needed? What what happens with these inclusion dashboards? So we're trying to get them up and running by the end of the year, actually. This is okay, one of, cool. the, That's one of the first things. Not, 
yeah, hot off the blocks. And this coupled with that local inclusion plan is about trying to get that better idea of what's going on in different areas. Because we know that yeah. there's, there's huge amounts of disparity in, across the country in terms of, you know, percentage of pupils getting EHCPs, yeah. percentage of pupils presenting with SEN. Um, and I think this is about getting a really good idea of what's going on in different areas. So if you can see in a particular area that they've got this huge problem with, um, I don't know, timeliness, for example, of getting an OT assessment, then you'll be able to address that. And that is ultimately the aim. We want to have these dashboards as indicators of what's going on, but then we want yep. to have the inclusion plans and the, the partnerships locally to be able to address that and make sure that each area is meeting its needs. Okay, cool. So one focus of the SEND and AP plan was moving towards early identification. There seems like quite a big emphasis on that yeah. and yeah. support for children with young children and young people with SEND. We've had loads of questions about teach training because I know there was mentions of yeah. more training for ITT and there was more training um, for early career teachers. What about general teachers? Are they going to be given more training so that they can support, give this like uh, identify children early and give the support early? So I'm really passionate about this because I think, you know, I again, like I talk to lots and lots of parents of, of families with SEN children. And one of the things that I hear the most is if this was only caught sooner, then yeah. we wouldn't be here. And when people talk about that sort of rise in needs in the system, and we, we know that, you know, the funding's gone up by 50% over the last four years and um, all of these things are happening. But often it's because you've got children and young people escalating into crisis, because actually yeah. if they had only been helped at the beginning, yes, then actually... Completely you know they, they some of these issues would be resolved they would have probably been supported through that sort of that part of their their um, education journey uh so uh what we're going to do on that is so i've just lost completely lost my train of thought <laughs> it's each training are you going to be training, training more teachers? Sorry, yeah. apologies <laughs> no don't worry <laughs> Apologies, I was just thinking of those difficult moments. Yeah, so in terms of teacher training, we're looking at your right initial teacher training and early careers framework. Yeah. Uh, so that's really embedded in, in teacher training as you begin. But we're also setting out best practice guides. So okay. three of the initial ones that we're working on is where we've seen you know these really big sort of rises in need. So mental health and well-being uh, and autism, for example, will be two of the earliest ones and early speech and language development, which again, okay. post-pandemic yeah, yeah. may have been a challenge. So those best practice guides will be out there. And then just coming back again, just to sort of round the circle in terms of accountability. In 2019, we changed uh, the way that schools are held accountable so that they can only be rated good or outstanding if they get good outcomes for SEN children. Yeah. So you will then have that sort of level of accountability to make sure that people are using these best practice guides and making sure they're using the best possible evidence when they're trying to teach children with SEN or disabilities. Okay. Yeah. So um, and if we talk about education and healthcare plans, I know there's been some big changes with that. Can you explain what you're planning to do? Will this and this sort of digitized standardized EHCPs, will this just be guidance or will it will local authorities have to use them? So we are going to work with parents and carers on this. And again, it's one of the things when you go and talk to these different families, they have this paperwork bank, which they can sort of mm. weigh by the kilo. It's, it is so enormously depressing if you think about how much time they're spending on bureaucracy. Absolutely. Time. <laughs> yeah, not having the time, yeah, the time they want to spend with their children. So what we're going to do is we have some areas who are already doing this. So some areas are doing it. So we're, we're working through that because we need to look at how we can make sure that we have a much simpler streamlined yeah. process with a digital offer. Obviously, if you can't can't use a digital offer which may not be people listening to your podcast thinking about it but if you yeah, know yeah. someone like that with they'll they'll always be a way to, to go through if you can't use yeah. um, an online offer um but but making sure that it's much simpler so it won't be mandatory straight off the bat okay. because we're going to work out how we can do this well and obviously you've got to get the right technology in place and everything uh but post that but if it works very well i'm very open to looking at how we can make sure that it's mandatory and we definitely want it to be um across the board as well so that parents have got that similar experience even if they move area they yes, can make sure that they can issue. have a few things with them, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I notice the government's keen to provide early support to children, not just children with SEND, but children who might need alternative provision. I presume the aim of that is to give the early supports that are more likely to remain in mainstream schooling. Um, what will that support look like? And how will you be identifying which children need that support? So for early support in mainstream education? Yeah, for the ones who might need alternative provision. So I think there's a few things because it depends what you, you know, it depends what's going on. I think firstly, 
look at something like early support and language. I think if you couple that with the phonics tests that we have mm -hmm. in schools, then that actually is a pretty good early identification technique for children with dyslexia, which means that if you couple that again with best practice um, interventions on reading, then actually you can pick up those things early. And one of the things that we know for people who struggle with reading, for example, is that often they go on later to develop social, emotional and mental health challenges. So that's what this is really about. I think it's about making sure that teachers are well equipped in mainstream education to yeah. pick up on challenges that children are finding and also have the right interventions to get them through that moment so that's I think the the, yeah. the best way of making sure that you've got that screening alongside of that though you've got things like the increase of educational psychologists so where you do need a particular diagnosis um, you can access that as well and I would say you know one of the biggest sort of rises in special education needs that we've seen is in autism so the NHS is you know, as you will know, um, we sort of published this jointly with our counterparts in the health department because it's really important that they are hugely part of this. But they are looking at innovative ways to diagnose uh, for autism as well, so that we're improving all of the pathways uh, mm -hmm. as well to make sure that, again, people can be diagnosed as early as possible and get yeah. that help as quickly as possible. Yeah. And that last question, because I know, I know we've not got much more time, but um, the new Senko qualification, because I've heard are you replacing the Nisenko with an MPQ and what's the reason behind this and we had a question on Twitter from Mrs C Nurture who asked will it be funded like the other NPQs are currently yes so it will be funded Good. and uh, the reason is is we you know we took we spoke to lots of people we took lots of evidence uh, about this and we think this is going to be really really high quality and uh, you know practical and it's been quality it's going to be quality um assured by the education endowment funding and also Ofsted mm -hmm. so this is just about making sure we've got the best possible evidence again the latest evidence best possible practice and all of that is being put into the new Senko MPQ so I think it will be a really positive thing uh, yeah. but people who have the old qualification won't have have to retrain we'll also do lots of again as, as you know I said talked about best practice guys sharing of best possible evidence so that everyone can benefit from that as well brilliant and if people want to find out more about the send an improvement send an AP improvement plan um where do we send them to then Claire we're sending them over to the government website I presume <laughs> yes yes so it should be on the government website um but again we're consulting on the whole document so that's worth knowing and yeah. you know that will be a process that people can feed into as well and the whole way through we are very passionate about co-production and making sure that people can feel in because their experiences are so important to us and that's what we want to get right yeah because it is just a plan isn't it at the moment it's not nothing's going to change immediately like it's nothing is changing today um from the not in terms there. of like in terms of those new standards and things like that all of that has got to be carefully worked through because you yeah. need to get it right and you know we have made sort of many changes already in terms of there's been a massive increase in funding for example and we're yeah. increasing the number of specialist school places yes. um increasing the number of educational psychologists all that stuff is underway but in terms of the the stuff that we want to make sure we get absolutely right there will be extensive consultation okay brilliant thanks ever so much for joining us really really appreciate it thank you so much for having me Hope you found that sort of whistle-stop tour of the SEND and AP improvement plan useful. Obviously time restraints meant that I couldn't ask all the questions I wanted to or that you wanted me to, so please do continue the discussion on social media. And we've got two articles by Twinkle Digest on the same topic, so have a read of those. I'll put the links to those articles and to the full SEND and AP plan in the show notes below. Thanks again for listening to Sending the Experts with me, Georgina Durant. <laughs>